her and point at it, it's not important enough to aim a laser pointer right. at. I agree. <laughs> My first grad student, the very first talk she ever gave was one of the like, everyone keeps having to close their eyes because like the laser pointer is like a weapon, and so then I banned laser pointer use in my group for a while. <laughs> I think it's much more engaging to touch the screen. I think it's like, it's much more yeah. physically fun. Yeah. I mean, some of the places you can't because the screen's like, no, you know, I'm 10 feet up or something like that, but I can reach the bottom of my slides. <laughs> All right, please come grab a seat. Okay, uh, it gives me enormous pleasure today to introduce <laughs> Professor Sarah Hurst. Uh, Sarah uh, began her studies as an undergraduate uh, studying planetary science and literature uh, at Caltech, mm -hmm. and then went off to do a PhD uh, in planetary sciences at uh, Arizona. Uh, and then you held an NSF fellowship as, uh, for your postdoc years uh, at Colorado. Yep. And then you are now a, an assistant professor, although I predict for not much longer, an assistant professor <laughs> <Fingers crossed. laughs> um, uh, at Johns Hopkins uh, University. So it's really wonderful to have you here. I also want to note that uh, Sarah is a co-investigator on the Dragonfly mission, which will be arriving at and zooming around the skies of Titan in 2034. So, <laughs> Not too long. <laughs> okay. eat, your, eat your vegetables, everyone. All right, take it away. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, just wanted to start by saying thank you so much for having me. Um, I've had the pleasure of, of visiting here once before, and, and it was today as it was then um, that I have had so many wonderful conversations with everyone. Um, there's so much interesting science uh, going on in this building that I feel like my brain is already full, and so it might be a little bit of a challenge to, uh, to talk about science more right now, uh, but we'll do our best. Um, so thank you so much for having me. It's really um, been a pleasure. Before I um, jump into what I want to talk to you about today, which are a series of experiments that we have been doing over the last 10 years to try to understand um, how atmospheric chemistry works, um, and in particular understand the processes that lead to the generation of hazes in atmospheres, um, I just want to quickly acknowledge my research group um, at Johns Hopkins. And in particular, I want to thank um, my research scientist, Chow He, who is standing behind me in this picture. Um, Chow uh, started um, actually before I did at Hopkins, which is a funny story. Um, and he has been working with me ever since. And he performed a lot of the experiments that I'm going to be talking about today. So I wanted to make sure to particularly acknowledge him. Um, so the title of my talk was Planets in a Bottle. And I'll get um, a little bit more into why uh, I use that title in a few minutes. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about a couple of different bottles. Um, I'll be talking about some experiments that we've done to understand Titan, Pluto, um, and of course a large set of experiments we've been doing to try to understand extrasolar planets. Um, depending on how quickly I do those things, I also might talk about the early Earth. Um, but before I jump into the experiments, I want to talk a little bit about why I have been working on this for 10 years. Um, and in particular, there's a couple of big picture questions that we're really interested in answering. And so one of the first questions that I'm really interested in answering is trying to understand how far organic chemistry can proceed in an, ap in an atmosphere in the absence of life. And there's two reasons for that um, that I kind of touched on at lunch if you were there. Um, the first reason is that we, you know, we don't really know what role atmospheres play in the origin and evolution of life, if at all. But we do know that they can be a source of material um, that may be important. And so we're trying to understand what that source of material may be like. If it's very simple, then life has to do a lot of work to get from there to the compounds that it finds useful. If it's very complicated, maybe life doesn't have to do very much work at all, and it can just use these ready-made molecules that have come out of the atmosphere. Um, but we don't really know where that, where that line is between things that can be produced only by um, by life and things that can be produced by atmospheric chemistry. Um, for that same reason, we're interested in answering this question because we're really starting to seriously think about the search for life. We're talking about sending Dragonfly to Titan. We've been talking about sending a lander to Europa. Um, we're you know, thinking really, really seriously about what the data from James Webb are going to look like and, and what um, the signature of life would be in the, in the atmosphere of an exoplanet. And so those are all talking about searching for life by looking for chemical signatures. 
And that can be kind of nerve wracking because that means that we're relying on an understanding of, you know, this set of chemicals or this particular molecule tells us that there's life and there's no other possible explanation. And to do that, we really have to understand what the difference is between these molecules that only exist because of life and molecules that can be made by a lot of different processes. So that's one of the big picture questions that we're interested in. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the other big picture question that I'm really interested in understanding is related. And that is, what does the what does um, what role does haze play in the habitability of a world? And so, just to give you a quick definition, when I say haze now and throughout the rest of the talk, I'm talking about particles that are generated from atmospheric photochemistry. So the best um, analogy that people are fami familiar with here on Earth is smog. Um, I spent lots of time in the LA basin, so maybe that's why I tend to think of it. But those types of particles. <clears throat> Um, and the reason that haze is important potentially for the habitability of a world is that particles interact with uh, light dif differently than gases do. And so they can have a really big impact on the temperature structure of a planet and its atmosphere. They can have a big impact on what wavelength photons actually make it to the surface of a planet, which can impact things like whether or not you know, DNA is getting mutations from EUV photons, all of these types of things. And so because of this role that, ha that haze plays in determining where photons are deposited, both in an atmosphere and on the surface, it can really impact whether or not, for example, water could be liquid on the surface or life would need um, some other shielding mechanism to protect it from very energetic photons. And so that's the other reason that we're really interested in trying to understand understand um, what types of atmospheres haze forms in, um, what the, the haze properties are like. So to answer these questions in the solar system, and I'm probably a little biased, um, the best place to study is Titan. <clears throat> so this is Titan from Voyager 1. Um, I always like to joke with people that you too can recreate the Voyager um, flyby of Titan in your own home with an iPhone in orange. Um, you'll get approximately as much information as we got from this image, um, although your image will be in much higher resolution. Um, the good news is that the Voyager spacecraft was carrying other instrumentation, um, and in particular, Voyager was carrying an instrument called IRIS, which was the infrared spectrometer. And so from IRIS, we discovered that Titan's atmosphere is full of all kinds of different organic molecules. And so there are things like propane right here. Um, so if you want to barbecue this weekend, there's plenty of propane around for you to do that. Um, there's also this molecule right here, hydrogen cyanide, if you don't particularly like your friends and family very much that you've invited to your barbecue. Um, we see a whole bunch of other molecules. I like how it took whoever that was a second to get that. <laughs> but I appreciate, I appreciate that you got there. Thank you. I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, there's, there's acetylene, there's ethane, there's all of these, um, all of these different molecules. But one of the things that I think happened from this data set that has really done us a disservice in trying to understand um, the complexity of organic chemistry, the way haze formation processes happen, is that if you actually sit and look at all of these molecules that Voyager found, there's only one molecule that is nitrogen containing that was discovered from um, the Voyager data set. And so we kind of left the Voyager era of studying Titan with this idea. And the idea is the following, that organic haze, like we see in the atmosphere of Titan, is produced from photochemistry that operates on methane um, in these kind of mildly reduced atmospheres, like the atmosphere of Titan. And in fact, this seems to have kind of become this one true path for haze formation. Um, and so you will often hear people talk about uh, Titan's hydrocarbon haze. I hear that all the time. You see it published all the time. And I'm going to spend the rest of today trying to dissuade you from this idea. Um, it turns out from a lot of the experiments that we've run that there are many different ways to make haze. There are many different atmospheres in which haze formation is favorable. And this is really important for those big picture questions that I started out by asking at the beginning. So we had the Voyager encounter. Um, at the time, we didn't really have any good um, ground-based assets or space-based telescopes to really do any further um, study of Titan. And so we didn't really learn much more about the atmosphere for another 10 or 15 years um, before we started getting things like the Infrared Space Observatory online, which started finding more molecules. So we were kind of left with our ability to model Titan's atmosphere and also our ability to do experiments after the Voyager encounter. And people started doing a lot of experiments of the type that I'm going to be talking about today. <clears throat> 
And so the first kind of sets of experiments that we did to try to understand Titan's atmosphere involved taking nitrogen and methane, putting energy into them um, to mimic sunlight, and see what happened. And so I just want to give you a quick summary of a couple of the things that we learned from these experiments um, to kind of frame why I think Titan is so interesting and how it has gotten more interesting to us over time. So we took these nitrogen methane experiments and two things I think are really important that came from many, many, many papers. Um, one of the things that we learned from these experiments is that it turns out that from these photochemical processes, nitrogen partitions preferentially into the solid phase. So another way to say that is when you run these experiments, you don't see a lot of gas phase nitrogen molecules. But when you analyze the composition of your solids, what you find out is that there's a lot of nitrogen in that solid. So why does that matter? First of all, if we go back to this question about how far chemistry can proceed in the absence of life, we know that all of life on Earth is based on the same small set of molecules. Um, some of those molecules include things like amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, nucleobases, which are the building blocks of DNA and RNA. And we know that those molecules are all based on the same small set of atoms. The smallest set of atoms we tend to think of is carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. So prior to this set of experiments where people started really understanding the nitrogen chemistry, we were excited about Titan because it had complex chemistry that involved two of those atoms, the carbon and the hydrogen. But we really thought there were going to have to be a lot more steps to turn that material into something that might actually be useful for life. And so this result showing us that, yes, although we didn't see a lot of nitrogen-containing molecules in the gas phase in Titan's atmosphere, that actually makes sense because the nitrogen wants to be in the solid. And so that told us that the nitrogen was probably really actively participating in the chemistry in a way that would be really useful for things like the origin of life. The other thing that we learned from these experiments that I think is really important is that it turns out that the presence of nitrogen in these experiments dramatically increases the production of particles. So if you take the same experiment and instead of using nitrogen in the gas, you use like helium or argon, something that's inert, you, you change your particle production rate by orders of magnitude. So now one of the things that we think we know is that one of the reasons Titan is so hazy is because of the nitrogen in its atmosphere, which is really, really different than our understanding of this chemistry before people started doing these lab experiments. And I will say that a lot of this laboratory work was then kind of backed up by the results that we found from Cassini, which really emphasized that we do actually know the nitrogen is really actively participating in the chemistry. So it's definitely not hydrocarbon haze. Um, all of the lab experiments and everything we know from Titan's atmosphere measurements from Cassini tell us that the nitrogen is participating. So now we have three of those four atoms. But it turns out there was another discovery from Cassini um, that told us Titan's chemistry might be even more interesting than we had thought. Um, maybe. Maybe not. That's Titan, by the way. <laughs> I put a pretty picture on here because the data I'm about to show you are not a pretty picture, so I apologize for that. Um, so these are data, unless, you're, unless you do plasma chemistry, at which point this is like the best thing. Um, so these are data from the C Cassini plasma spectrometer, which is called CAPS. And um, what I want you to see is labeled right here. And so, ooh, sorry, I got a new computer, so we might, that might happen more than once. Um, but what we discovered from, from CAPS is that there is energetic oxygen precipitating into the top of Titan's atmosphere. So CAPS has measured KeV oxygen with a flux of about 10 to the 6 per centimeter squared per second, which is a pretty high flux. And so all of a sudden, we're talking about having all four of those atoms that are important. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. I hope you all have just asked yourselves why there is KEV oxygen precipitating into the top of Titan's atmosphere. Good. Okay, at least one person asked themselves that question. The answer is Enceladus. So this teeny tiny moon of Saturn is shooting water out of its south pole. Um, some fraction of that water ends up um, basically hitching a ride on the magnetic field lines out to Titan, and the oxygen ends up getting deposited into Titan's atmosphere. We know that these plumes are water because the scientists eventually convinced the engineers to let us fly Cassini through that on more than one occasion, and so we actually have mass spectral data. Um, this just shows that the plume is mostly water. There's all kinds of other things too, but that's a completely separate talk. Enceladus is also a very interesting place. So 
One of the things that we then were trying to understand is what does the oxygen do when it gets there, right? We have very reactive oxygen in the top of Titan's atmosphere, but then what happens? And so we started out by using photochemical models to try to answer that question. And one of the things that we found out is that the oxygen is immediately participating in the photochemistry, and it actually results in the formation of carbon monoxide. So that was really cool because carbon monoxide is the fourth most abundant molecule in Titan's atmosphere. And its presence in Titan's atmosphere is almost entirely certainly because of the plumes of Enceladus, which is super weird. And so there's this really unique, yeah. Yeah, so because the oxygen, um, the atomic oxygen abundance is relatively low, we don't get the formation of molecular oxygen. And because we don't get the formation of molecular oxygen, we then don't get the formation of ozone. If there was abundant oxygen, then we might get some ozone present. But this atmosphere is, is pretty reduced. Does that make sense? Yes, it's just how life could In terms of being protected from the UV photons? Yeah, so that's actually a really great question and kind of goes back to what I was saying before. So there's some evidence that early Earth had a haze layer, and a lot of people think that that haze layer may have played the role that the ozone layer plays now in terms of protecting the surface from UV photons. And so that may actually be some uh, one of the reasons why a haze layer would be useful to nascent life, to basically protect it from those extremely energetic photons that you don't want to make it down to the surface. Yeah. Um, so anyway, there's this really interesting connection between these two very different um, moons in the Saturn system, and that provides Titan with all of these, um, these four atoms that we think are important. And so now Titan's real interesting, because we know that there's organic chemistry happening. We know it has the possibility of involving all four of these atoms, and so of course we want to study it more. There was one more thing that happened from Cassini um, that has really fundamentally altered our ideas about how all of this chemistry works and has made Titan such an interesting place. So interesting, in fact, that we managed to convince NASA to let us send a dual quadcopter there. Um, so again, this isn't going to be a pretty picture. Um, it comes from the same instrument. So prior to the arrival of Cassini, the heaviest molecule that had been detected in Titan's atmosphere was benzene, which is C6H6. It has a mass of 78. That was detected um, in data that were taken from the Infrared Space Observatory. So that was our idea of complexity. That's one of the most complex molecules you see in a planetary atmosphere besides Earth. And so we thought to ourselves, OK, you know, when we start flying Cassini's mass spectrometer through the top of Titan's atmosphere, we'll probably see things that have like six or seven heavy atoms. And so the mass spectrometer that was specifically designed to study Titan's upper atmosphere had a mass cutoff at 100 AMU. So that was as high, as heavy of an ion as we could measure. And so this is what a mass spectrum would look like, making that assumption. So mass to charge is on the x-axis. This is just a number on the y-axis. This is not data from the mass spectrometer, by the way, <coughs> although this is what you might think it would look like. Luckily, the plasma spectrometer was also on when we were flying through the top of Titan's atmosphere, because when it started sending data back, this is what those data look like. So this is a log scale which is a really good way to stress out a chemist who's used to looking at mass spectra because you don't usually plot, plot your mass spectra on a log scale. Um, and so instead of thinking that you know, there were going to be these ions that were like benzene, like 78 or maybe 100 AMU, Cassini measured um, ions that have a mass to charge of up to 10,000 AMU. Now, something that heavy is almost certainly carrying more than one charge. So now you're talking about things that are 20 or 30 or 40,000 AMU. So rather than our six or seven heavy carbon or heavy atoms, six or seven carbon atoms, we're talking about a molecule that has seven or 800 carbon atoms. So to give you a sense of scale, in case you don't think about these things, this is our friend benzene, C6H6, mass of 78. I sat in ChemDraw one day and just like copied and pasted over and over and over again. So this is not a real molecule, chemists in the room who are going to yell at me about this. But just to give you a sense of how wrong we were, um, this is like the scale of how of our misunderstanding of the complexity of the chemistry in Titan's atmosphere. And so I hope that it's now obvious, um, the following statement is now obvious, which is that this discovery has really dramatically changed our understanding of the complexity of Titan's atmospheric chemistry, of how particle formation works in planetary atmospheres. And this applies not just um, to Titan, but potentially to other places in the solar system. One thing to point out in looking at this data set, this instrument was designed to measure very small ions in the Saturnian magnetosphere. So things like that O plus flux that it discovered going into the top of Titan's atmosphere, we cannot identify any of these molecules from this data set.
Zip, zilch, none, zero. Um, this is actually why I started doing lab experiments. Um, but it turns out that Titan is not the exception. And I'm starting to wonder if maybe Titan might be the rule. So these are now infrared data from Saturn. Um, this is taken from the Cassini infrared instrument Sears instead of Voyager, but you get the idea. Again, uh, we have some of the molecules we saw in Titan's atmosphere, acetylene, ethane, things with a few heavy atoms. Um, there's also phosphine if you really hate your friends and family because that will kill you real fast. Um, but this is kind of the scale of complexity we were seeing from looking at the gas phase measurements. At the end of Cassini's mission, we purposefully crashed Cassini into Saturn um, to protect the moons that might have life. Um, but we were also doing that because we wanted to get our first in situ measurements of Saturn's atmospheric composition. And in particular, we were really interested in trying to measure the hydrogen to helium ratio because it's very challenging to measure that from remote sensing, but very easy to do it from a mass spectrometer. So we were expecting the mass spectrometer to send us back hydrogen and helium in the data. Uh, which have a mass of two and four, respectively. So they should be at the very, very far end of the mass spectrum that I'm about to show you. And there should be nothing else on the mass spectrum that I'm about to show you. Um, but this is what the mass spec data look like from the top of Saturn's atmosphere instead. So there's hydrogen. There's our friend helium. Um, we also have methane, ammonia, water. Uh, if you want to talk about complexity, that's benzene. This is probably toluene. There's some hydrogen cyanide, uh, propane, a whole bunch of other things. Um, if you ever spend any time looking at mass spec, there's a bunch of nitrogen chemistry happening in here. Um, we're still trying to finish analyzing this data. I have one of, one of my grad students is getting ready to submit a paper about it. But suffice it to say that Saturn's upper atmosphere has a lot of really interesting organic chemistry going on in it as well. Um, unfortunately, Cassini was functioning extremely well at the end of its mission. Um, but there was one instrument that wasn't on um, by the time that the mission ended, and it was that plasma spectrometer. And so we don't have plasma spectrometer data from the top of Saturn's atmosphere to compare to that data that we have from the top of Titan's atmosphere. But I would be willing to bet that there's some really interesting complex um, ions in the top of Saturn's atmosphere as well. In fact, this is a much more interesting mass spectrum than the data from the similar instrument from Titan. Um, and so I think we really have to rethink our ideas about the types of chemistry that are happening in ionospheres because I think the, the level of complexity has really been misunderstood. So this is kind of where we were at. We had this idea that, you know, we have the possibility of this really complicated chemistry in the top of Titan's atmosphere that involves these four atoms that are really important for making prebiotic molecules, but we couldn't identify these molecules with the data. And also, photochemistry models are not particularly good at this type of question. The Titan, state-of-the-art Titan photochemistry models can go up to like six or seven heavy atoms, and they do a really good job. But for a lot of reasons, you really can't go much larger than that at this point in time. And so we couldn't use the data to figure out what those molecules might be. We couldn't use a model to figure out what they might be. And so that was why I started getting interested in using laboratory experiments to try to figure out what types of molecules might be being made in Titan's atmosphere and what that also means for these big picture questions that I was asking before. So all of these experiments operate on the same principle I kind of mentioned before. We take our simple abundant atmospheric gases. If we're doing a Titan experiment, this is going to be things like nitrogen, methane, maybe carbon monoxide. If we were doing Venus, it would be CO2 and SO2 and maybe a little nitrogen. We expose them to an energy source. Um, Every energy source you can possibly think of has been used in these experiments at some point. The two most common energy sources at this point in the field are using a UV lamp and using some type of plasma source. We use both of those sources in my lab at Hopkins. That starts the chemical processes that lead to the creation of new gas phase molecules and may also lead to the creation of a solid depending on the conditions of the experiment. And so we sometimes make a complex organic solid. This was a Titan uh, experiment. It makes a solid that's suspiciously Titan colored. Some of you have, may have used the word tholin used in reference to that material. That's the only time I will say that word in this talk. Um, if you want to know why, we can talk about it later. Um, and just to give you a little bit more detail, um, in my lab at Hopkins, we have something that we call Phaser, which is the Planetary Haze Research Chamber. Um, we designed and built it to, to enable a study of a wide range of atmospheres. And so we wanted to be able to access the entire solar system and a large swath of exoplanets that we think are interesting for these types of questions. That means that we can run our experiments from maybe 90 to 800 Kelvin. 
We use one of two energy sources to initiate the chemistry. We have a Lyman alpha um, photon source that actually goes from 115 to 400 nanometers with a peak at Lyman alpha. And we also have a cold plasma discharge that generates energetic electrons that can also initiate the chemistry. Um, we run at a millibar, which is kind of the standard pressure that we use um, in the lab for various reasons, but it's also the region that we think a lot of this interesting chemistry is initiated in planetary atmospheres. We also have a residual gas analyzer, which is a little mass spectrometer hooked up to the chamber to measure the gas phase products in our uh, experiment. Just to give you a sense of what it looks like um, when it's actually operating, um, that's the chamber while it's on. That's an excited exoplanet astronomer for scale. Some of you probably recognize that's Caroline Morley, who I think has finally, after many years, forgiven me for always showing this picture when I talk about the experiment. Um, but I just like wanted to show like how exciting the lab can be, right? Um, this uh, chamber is about the size of a two liter bottle, and so this is where this idea of kind of planets in a bottle comes from. Okay, that was a very long-winded introduction, but hopefully now you understand why we're trying to, uh, trying to answer these types of questions, and so I can just jump into all of our results. So the first thing that we started trying to look at was we were trying to understand the effect of carbon monoxide on haze formation and composition. And the reason for this goes back to this discovery that there were oxygen ions precipitating into the top of Titan's atmosphere. Prior to that discovery, no one had really investigated what would happen if you put carbon monoxide into these experiments. And so we wanted to find out. Now it turns out that Titan isn't the only hazy nitrogen, methane, carbon monoxide atmosphere in our solar system. This image is cheating a little bit because it is to scale, but on the left you have Titan and on the right you have Pluto. These were both taken at similar phase angles. Um, the last time that I was here giving a talk was actually before the New Horizons encounter. And Mark, I think, was sitting in the exact same seat the last time and raised his hand and asked me if Pluto was going to be hazy based on all of the experiments that we had done. And I said to Mark, and I'm happy that this is recorded, um, so that I have proof that I predicted it, that I thought Pluto was going to be quite hazy based on everything we knew. Um, and it turns out that this is Pluto, which I have to admit, even though I was sure it was going to be hazy, I didn't think that it was going to look like this. Um, and so I just show this picture because I feel like everyone needs to know that this is what Pluto looks like. Um, so anyway, this question is also relevant to Pluto in addition to Titan. So we started out just by looking at what would happen if we put carbon monoxide into these experiments. So on the x-axis now and for the next few slides is going to be the percent carbon monoxide in our initial gas mixture. And on this particular plot, uh, the y-axis is aerosol mass loading, which is a fancy way of saying how much gunk did we make. Um, and so this was for a 0.1% methane experiment. The bulk um, gas in this experiment is nitrogen, and we were using a UV source. So in this first set of experiments, we saw that as we put more CO into the gas mixture, we made more stuff, which kind of left us scratching our heads for various historical reasons. Um, we switched the methane abundance to 2% methane. The same thing happened. We switched energy sources to uh, plasma discharge from a, from a Tesla coil, um, and we saw the same trend. And so... That led to a lot of questions. Um, our first question kind of being is, what is the actual role of CO in this process? Is it that having CO in the gas mixture means that we're going to make more particles in the first place, which would mean that CO is affecting the nucleation, that first step in making a particle? Or is CO actually just affecting the growth rate of the particles? And so we end up with the same number of particles. They just grow much faster for whatever reason. And it turned out that the way that we were doing these measurements actually let us answer that question immediately because what we were really measuring was the size distribution. So this is the size distribution from the 2% methane um, UV experiment. And you can see we're making particles that have a diameter on average of around 20 nanometers. I picked the very most extreme case just to demonstrate what was going on. So the other um, data I'm going to show you are the 2% methane, 5% CO data, which look like this. So instead of making particles that were on average 20 nanometers, we're now talking about making particles that are more like 150 nanometers on average. Um, you can also just see, although this is a very bizarre unit, this is like basically the number of particles. And so you can also see that we're making more particles. Now it turns out, when we went and looked through that whole data set that I just showed you, um, the same trends held. And so when we looked at um, particle size, we see that as we put more CO into the gas mixture, we're getting larger particles on average. Um, when we looked at number density, we saw that as we put more CO into the gas mixture, we were making more particles on average. And so that told us that, C in fact, CO was doing both of those things. It was making nucleation, that first step of having new particles, more efficient, but it was also making the growth much more efficient. And so we were ending up with larger 
larger particles. So it was a combination of both of those processes that were resulting in us getting more stuff. So that was good. But we still wanted to know more about why that was happening. And so one of the things that we were able to do is actually look at the gas phase composition and see what was happening in the gas phase as we were changing the CO abundance. So this is, again, still the CO on the x-axis. Um, the y-axis is now in an arbitrary unit of some type. And the only thing I actually want you to look at on this plot are these red diamonds, and so which are labeled 2AMU. This is molecular hydrogen in the gas phase. And so one of the things we saw immediately when we looked at the gas phase measurements is that as we put more CO into the experiment, we were decreasing the molecular hydrogen abundance. And that immediately told us one of the important things that CO is doing. Because we knew from experiments dating back to Miller-Urey that if you have a lot of hydrogen in your gas mixture, you don't make as many particles. You don't build these really long chains because they run into a hydrogen atom and it terminates the chain. This is why even though uh, Jupiter and Saturn have methane in their atmospheres, they're not nearly as hazy as Titan because there's so much molecular hydrogen. And this has been reproduced in the lab a bunch of times. So that was pretty exciting. We still don't know exactly the chemical processes that are resulting in that, but we know now that one of the things that CO is doing is pulling hydrogen out of the gas phase. One of the other things that we were able to do was actually look at the composition of the particles. People kept telling me for a really long time when I first started presenting these results that it wasn't that interesting because we were putting more carbon in the system. And carbon makes four bonds, and so of course we were making more stuff. It had nothing to do with the oxygen. Why did I even think the oxygen was participating in the chemistry? Oxygen is bad for haze formation. Um, but we did elemental analysis, and the, one of the main things that we found is that as you put more CO, so this is the CO again in the initial gas mixture, you get more oxygen in the solid phase. So not only was the oxygen actively participating in the chemistry, but it was actually resulting in conversion into solids. And so this is important because then we go back to all of these prebiotic molecules that have all four of these atoms, and we thought to ourselves, we should go look for those. So we did. Um, and in this particular experiment, we found all five um, nuclear bases that life on Earth uses, so the two purine bases, adenine and guanine, and the three pyrimidine bases, thiamine, uracil, and cytosine. These are the familiar ATCG of DNA and RNA. We also looked for all of the proteinogenic amino acids, so the amino acids that life on Earth uses. Um, we definitively identified the two smallest ones, glycine and alanine. And so we know now that these types of molecules can be made through gas phase chemistry that's occurring in atmospheres that have all of these atoms. Um, I think, although we don't have any data that can actually show this yet, that these molecules are present in the gas phase in Titan's atmosphere, that they are present in the solid on the surface. Um, and so this tells us that an atmosphere can be a source of these complicated materials. We actually looked for all of the proteinogenic um, amino acids that life on Earth uses that are made only of those four atoms, because there's some ones that use other things like sulfur. Um, we found... As I mentioned, the structures of glycine and alanine, we actually found the molecular formulas of all of these ones that are in yellow, but we weren't able to determine the structure one way or another, so we're not sure whether or not they were there. It's only these ones at the bottom that we didn't find any evidence of at all, um, which we thought was really exciting. But then we did another experiment looking for these types of molecules that showed something really interesting. Um, and this was just a recent experiment that I did with a, a collaborator at the University of Northern Iowa. So we ran two sets of experiments that were identical except for the energy source. So one with a plasma and one with a UV source. And you can see the molecules that we looked at are very similar to that list that I just mentioned. So the plasma column has lots more letters in it <laughs> than, the, than the UV source column. And what that means was, in the plasma experiments, we found all of those nucleobases that I just mentioned. We actually found a couple of life on, that life on Earth doesn't use, xanthine and hyposanthine. So that actually emphasizes that this isn't contamination from somebody sneezing in the chamber. Um, we again found glycine and alanine. We saw some evidence of some of these other molecules like I mentioned before. There's also some other molecules that prebiotic chemists tend to think of as interesting like guanidine and urea. Um, but when we did the UV experiments, the only thing that we found was glycine. None of these other things. And so the reason that that's interesting to me is because when we are trying to use an energy source to simulate the chemistry, these plasma sources tend to be a lot more um, analogous to the really energetic environment of an upper atmosphere. So the place where your EUV photons are getting deposited, the place where your energetic particles, in the case of Titan, are coming from the Saturnian magnetosphere, or maybe coming from the solar wind if you don't have a magnetic field, um, these UV sources 
because of the wavelength range that they cover, are much more analogous to deeper down in the atmosphere, like in the stratosphere on Titan. And so the reason that we thought this is so interesting is that this tells us that this chemistry, if it's happening in these atmospheres, is probably happening very high in the atmosphere, in that region where I told you those really heavy ions exist, for example. And so we thought this was a really interesting result and something that had been neglected in the past, we generally tend to think of this interesting uh, organic chemistry happening much deeper in the atmosphere when we think about terrestrial planets. So just to give you a quick summary of everything that I just said, we looked at the effect of carbon monoxide on haze formation and composition, and we found that the particle size and the number density, and therefore the total amount of gunk that we're making, all increase as a function of increasing CO abundance in the gas mixture. This was true um, for either energy source we looked at. It's now been replicated across multiple experimental setups as well. We know that the presence of CO decreases the gas phase molecular hydrogen. Um, and I actually didn't mention, but we did NMR on our solids. Um, and we see that actually the where the hydrogen is located structurally in the solid actually changes from saturated to unsaturated structures. We know that the aerosol becomes more oxygen rich. And actually, that's at the expense of nitrogen, which I didn't mention, as the CO abundance increases. And we also see that the addition of CO results in the production of these molecules that are of prebiotic interest, so things like amino acids and nucleobases. And I should mention, because I've now said it a couple of times, and I said it um, also at lunch, that you know even if these types of molecules are present on Titan, if there's life on Titan for lots of reasons, it wouldn't use them. But they're a really good example that we have of the types of complexity that life requires. So these are the molecules that life is built on. That's an example of the complexity. If we see that complexity in Titan's atmosphere, there's no reason to think it didn't happen in the atmosphere of the early Earth, that it might not be happening in the atmospheres of exoplanets. And so even though those aren't great molecules for thinking about life on Titan, um, I think it's still important to use them as examples. So then I was super interested in oxygen-containing molecules. Because it turns out not only had people not looked at the effect of carbon monoxide, but they actually hadn't really looked at the effect of any oxygen-containing molecules except for CO2. So I was like, OK, how do I expand my phase space? And it turns out that in the solar system, we don't actually have a particularly broad range of atmospheres. They cover a relatively small range of temperature. They cover a relatively small uh, space in terms of composition. And so this was right around the time that like exoplanets kind of started exploding. So I thought, well, this is a good excuse to expand my phase space. <laughs> Um, but then I was immediately overwhelmed by the fact that there are like way too many exoplanets. So I kind of went from not having enough planets to having too many planets, which I think is a common problem for planetary scientists who move from the solar system to outside the solar system. So we were trying to figure out what planets to, to start out by focusing on. And the phase space that we chose were super Earth and mini Neptunes. And so the original question that we started out asking was, which super Earth and mini Neptune atmospheres will be hazy? And also, what will that haze be like? So why did we pick Super Earths and Mini Neptunes? So one reason was really just practical, <laughs> that it turns out we now know from Kepler that planets that are larger than Earth and smaller than Neptune are the most common type of planet that we have in the galaxy. And so that means that a large fraction of the observable atmospheres are going to belong to Super Earths and Mini Neptunes. Um, I really need to update this plot now that Tess actually has found planets. Um, but this is, you know, just shows the predicted Tess yield. And again, these planets that Tess is going to is finding and will continue to find are the ones that we're going to really be able to study with things like James Webb. And those fall in that phase space. The other reason that we um, decided to, to look at this phase space is it turns out of the planets in this in this mass range or this size range that have spectra that have been taken, it's actually really nerve wracking to show someone else's data when they're sitting in the room. Um, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> now that I've gotten over that moment, um, <laughs> a lot of these uh, planets are coming up with what is often referred to as a flat spectrum. This is the poster child example of this problem, GJ1214b. And you can see that you know all of the effort that went into to measuring all of these data points can be fit with a line, a flat line. And so that tells us that there's some type of particle in that atmosphere that is obscuring the spectral features, flattening that line. GJ1214b is not the only problem child. It turns out that a lot of the planets that we've been able to look at thus far exhibit the same issue. And so that tells us that this this particular phase space probably has a lot of planets that have particles in their atmosphere. Now, at this point, we don't necessarily know if these particles are clouds or hazes, which are different things, exoplanet people. Um, but a lot of them will be hazes. And so this is why we chose to focus on this region. But we had another problem. 
when we study the solar system, I, I know to like decimal point precisions exactly what the mixing ratios are of the molecules in these atmospheres. And so I can use that as the starting point for my gas mixtures. But we don't have data like that for exoplanets yet. And so we had to kind of decide where we were going to start given that. And so what we decided to do was build a very broad matrix that would cover a wide range of planets, both in temperature and composition space, to try to really just give us a big picture idea of where haze formation might be efficient. Because nobody had ever done experiments in this temperature range, in these composition spaces. We really had no idea what was going to happen. So this is the matrix that we built. Um, we started out by doing three, four, and 600 Kelvin experiments at 100, 1,000, and 10,000 times solar metallicity. If you don't think in metallicity space, um, these are kind of hydrogen-rich, water-rich, and CO2-rich atmospheres. Um, and then we just took these gas mixtures and put energy into them to find out what would happen. Um, and I'm going to, because I always forget to do it at this point, but I want to draw your attention to the fact that um, none of these gas mixtures have methane in them. The CO2 rich, no, no methane. Okay. okay, good. All right, so we turned on the energy source and this is what happened. So the first thing is that we saw a wide range of haze production rates, which is good news for the people who are sick of looking at flat lines because there should be a bunch of planets that are not a flat line. Um, in fact, we saw on the or we saw about four orders of magnitude range in in particle production rates. But something really weird is going on with the water rich experiments, which we did not predict, because those are our two highest production rates, the three and four hundred Kelvin water rich experiments. And this gray line right here is our standard Titan experiment. So these two experiments are making more particles than our Titan experiment. If you can envision a planet that is hazier than Titan, that is what these experiments are telling us might happen. Um, I really pointed out that there was no methane in these experiments just to show you that we can apparently make organic haze particles without having methane in the initial gas mixture, which was a huge surprise to us. Um, we then did these with the UV energy source. We saw kind of similar trends, a wide range of production rates. Again, this, three in, this 300 Kelvin um, water-rich experiment is the highest production rate. We're still trying to figure out why that is. Um, between myself and my research scientist um, who, who ran a lot of these experiments, we have something like 20 years combined experience running these types of experiments. We took bets on that matrix that I showed you at the beginning and were completely wrong, both of us, on what happened. Um, so there's a reason why you do this. One of the other things that we saw is that when we actually look at the particles that are produced, we see a wide range of colors. And so this is interesting because this tells us immediately that spectrally these particles are going to be really different. Um, you can see that the, those two very high production rate experiments also look suspiciously tight in color, which is very weird. Um, I will tell you that we have measured the composition of these particles and they are not even remotely the same as the Titan uh, particles, which is really interesting and hopefully we'll have a paper submitted soon about those. Um, we made colors that we've never seen before in the lab and I don't think anybody else has ever seen before. So my group decided this is olive green and this one's chocolate brown and I'm a little worried that I might not be feeding them enough since they came up with food words for both of them so more food at group meeting I think was my takeaway message from from this result um, we are I promise and I said this so many times publicly but I'm gonna say it again because it's actually true um, working on measuring optical constants for all of these particles we're gonna do it from 175 nanometers to 27 microns it will cover all of web it will cover anything you could possibly want to do related to an atmosphere um, the instrument is finally working um, and so that will happen soon, I hope. Um, the other thing that we did, I mentioned we um, look at the gas phase composition. And so some really interesting things started happening when we looked at the gas phase composition. So I apologize for the fact that this, this plot is so busy. It's one of these like abstract summary um, plots, but it has everything I want to tell you on it. So this is all of those experiments I just showed you. All nine gas mixtures, both energy sources. So this is summarizing 18 experiments. Um, the X's indicate that we saw the production of organic molecules in the gas phase. You will see that we saw that in all of them, except for, I don't know what this experiment was doing. It was just off having a party all by itself. Um, and so that's interesting because, again, I mentioned that this, this CO2-dominated um, atmospheres don't have any methane in them. And we're still making organic molecules, both in the gas phase and actually in the solid, um, when we don't have any methane in the initial gas mixture. Um, we also see the production of molecular oxygen, which is shown by the stars. 
And so that's interesting, and I'll come back to that in a second. And then finally, these diamonds are things that we have termed prebiotic precursors. So these are molecules that the, that the origin of life community tends to think of as being really important. So things like formaldehyde, acetonitrile, relatively simple organic molecules, but that have functional groups that are important for origin of life chemistry. Um, and you see that there's a number of places where we're seeing those as well. Um, but I really want to emphasize that kind of this phase space that we have right here, we're seeing the simultaneous production of organic molecules, some of which are considered to be important for prebiotic chemistry, and abiotic production of molecular oxygen. And so that's something that people often consider to be, the combination of those two things considered to be something that we should think of as a biosignature. Um, and I'm like 99.999% sure that we have not made life in my chamber, in my lab. Um, if we have, I will very happily accept the Nobel Prize on behalf of my research group. Um, but instead, I think that we just need to think very carefully um, about what we're, we're thinking about in terms of biosignatures. And this is one of the reasons for running these types of experiments, because if we can make it in my lab, then it's not a good biosignature. Um, so just to give you a quick summary of that part of the exoplanets, um, we found that the hydrogen-dominated cases uh, really produce substantial amounts of particles, Titan-like, uh, in the case of the plasma experiments. We know just from visual inspection of the particles that they're going to have really dramatically different optical properties, and that seems to really be a function of metallicity rather than temperature. Um, we do know that the production rates, at least both the metallicity and temperature, do matter. Um, and we also saw the production of molecular oxygen and organics um, produced simultaneously uh, in the gas phase. I forgot to take out the next slide because I do realize that this is actually like being recorded and streamed. Um, so just ignore this. <laughs> but this is, uh, I'm going to show you some new results that we have um, submitted that have just come back from review and I think will be accepted. So it's probably fine that we're streaming this. Um, so I lied to you a little bit about the experiments that we've done because we've actually done our 800 Kelvin experiments too. And one of the reasons the 800 Kelvin experiments are so interesting is we're now adding a new atom that we haven't had before in any of our experiments, and where very, very little work has done, and that's sulfur. So the CO2-rich case at 800 Kelvin has hydrogen sulfide in it. Um, one of the reasons that sulfur is so interesting is because if we expand our set of atoms that are required for life just a little bit larger, the two atoms that we tend to add next are sulfur and phosphorus. And so this is one of the reasons why the addition of sulfur is really interesting. So one of the first things that we found is that the presence of hydrogen sulfide increases the particle production rate. So to check this idea, we ran an identical experiment, but instead of having hydrogen sulfide, we put argon in the gas mixture so that we wouldn't have to worry about um, it interacting at all uh, with the other gases. And so in both the plasma and the UV, we see that the production rate increases when we add hydrogen sulfide. These are the actual numbers, um, just to show you that in both cases they go up um, by about, to, about a factor of three. Um, I went back and took this plot from our original paper and added um, the 800 Kelvin point uh, to it. And that shows us, oh, it doesn't show up very well here, but it's right here. It goes up to here. Um, and that shows us something really interesting because for the 100 and 1,000 times cases, it was looking like as we increased temperature, we were decreasing the particle production rate. But the opposite thing now seems to be happening um, at the 10,000 times solar metallicity cases, um, which now has me really wishing that we had designed a chamber that could go to 1,000 Kelvin. Um, but unfortunately, we are not going to be doing that. Somebody else can do it. Um, and so we thought that was really interesting. The other thing that happened that was really interesting is we looked at the gas phase um, composition, and we found out that although the, pres the presence of hydrogen sulfide doesn't actually really affect the total amount of gas phase products, it really changes their composition. In particular, we reduce the amount of molecular oxygen that we're seeing pretty substantially, and we also see the production of organosulfur compounds, which is bad news because that's another class of molecules that people had really been thinking about as the type of molecule that you might consider to be a biosignature if you saw it in something like web data. And now we're seeing the production of these things abiotically in our chamber. So just to give a quick summary of, of um, that section, the presence of hydrogen sulfide seems to be increasing the production rate. Again, this is just one experiment, our 800 Kelvin 10,000 times case. We've run the other 800 Kelvin experiments. They're not nearly as interesting, which is why I didn't show the results here. Um, but don't remember that I said that when we submit the paper on those ones, <laughs> in case you're the referee. Um, the production of gas phase organics was relatively unaffected, um, but the oxygen, molecular oxygen production really decreased. And then we also, um, 
um, we're seeing these production of these organosulfur compounds. Um, and then in the 10,000 times metallicity experiments, the production rate seems to be increasing as we increase the temperature, which is not something I think any of us predicted, um, but is interesting, I'm sure, for some re reason. So we did CO, we did CO2, we did water. It's a pretty good collection of the, of the oxygen-bearing compounds. But I really wanted to know what molecular oxygen does for haze formation. And that one turns out to be challenging because we don't have a lot of atmospheres that have molecular oxygen in them where haze formation processes might happen. Um, and so I just want to quickly walk you through um, some oxygen uh, experiments that we did. Um, and in particular, we were interested in trying to understand the effect of oxygen on this haze layer that's been predicted for the early Earth. So basically, what was happening during the rise of oxygen as there were small amounts of oxygen in the atmosphere? Um, did that have an impact on this potential haze layer? And part of the reason we were interested in this is that we have this idea that oxidized atmospheres are less favorable for photochemical haze formation, with the poster child of this being the Earth. Um, the people who live over here and up here might disagree with you, but in general, we, for example, do not see a global haze layer at this point in Earth's history. But one of the things that we know is that not all oxygen-bearing molecules are the same, and so we wanted to kind of systematically study what would happen as we added small amounts of oxygen. So the plot that I want to finish showing you is super complicated, so I'm going to walk you through it step by step, step rather than just dumping it on there and then having you all scratch your heads at me. So we started out by doing experiments that were just methane and nitrogen, our kind of standard experiments that we do. These were the methane concentrations that we were using. Um, now we're using volume as a measure of our production rate, but it's the same idea as before. You can see that we get a range of production rates as a function of methane. This is pretty standard. Um, we see as we increase the amount of methane, it goes up, and then it starts to come back down. This is a, this is a trend that's been um, observed a number of times in a number of different places uh, in experimental setups, and so this is kind of what it looks like. Um, if we had kept increasing the methane abundance, it would actually turn all the way back over. We think this is to do with an optical depth effect and that um, the methane is just absorbing the photons that would generate um, a lot of the subsequent chemistry. So then we added CO2. This is the only other oxygen-containing molecule that had really been studied prior to our work. And so our expectation was that as we put CO2 into the experiment, the production rate would go down, because that's what everyone has shown. Um, and that was what, would ha what happened, so that was good news. And so these are our CO2 abundances that we were using. I want to point out here that for all of the experiments, except for the ones that had no CO2, we always had more CO2 than methane in these experiments. This was the, the particular phase space that we were using based on some models of what the atmospheric composition may have been like at this period of Earth's history. So I'm going to collapse this plot back over here. So now we have our no oxygen or CO2. We have our experiments that just have no oxygen. Now we're going to start adding oxygen systematically to see what happens. Now our prediction was that the production rate was going to drop off dramatically almost immediately because that was what everyone assumed would happen. This is why Earth doesn't have a global haze layer. But that wasn't exactly what happened. So it turned out for small amounts of molecular oxygen, in this case we're talking about two parts per million, for all of the experiments the production rate actually increased which was really surprising. Um, and we have some ideas about why that is in terms of uh, nitrogen chemistry, which I'll show you more about in a minute. But then as we put more oxygen into the experiment, the production rate de decreased in the way that we expected it to. One thing that we don't know is whether this is simply a result of the chemistry that's happening or if this is, again, an optical depth effect. Oxygen absorbs the photons in this wavelength region very strongly, and so at some point you really are just running out of photons to do any of the other chemistry. There's ways to try to separate those two things experimentally, but we haven't done the experiments. So just to give you a sense of what those production rates mean, um, I'm going to do the same thing that I did before. I'm going to compare these results to our standard Titan experiment in this particular experimental setup. You'll see that actually in a lot of these cases, um, our production rate is much higher than our standard Titan experiment. And so that kind of goes to show that this is phase space in the early Earth that would have been favorable for haze formation. Um, I took measurements in the lab one day. And you can kind of see where those fall. Um, you can also see that you can see the end of the lab. So the lab wasn't particularly hazy that day, which I'm very grateful for because I breathe that lab air every day for three years. And I can still live to tell about it. So not particularly hazy. Um, but I want to show you that every single one of these experiments was generating particles from this chemistry. And the way I can show you that is this. So we took our gas mixture that we made and we're irradiating, and we ran it through every single part of the entire setup into the instrument that we were measuring things without turning the lamp on. And that's what this looks like.
And so every single one of these experiments, even the ones that had 2% molecular oxygen, which is a substantial amount more than the methane in these experiments, was still generating particles from this chemistry. But other really interesting things started happening. So one thing that started happening was that as we put molecular oxygen into the experiment, the composition of the particles really started changing. So this is just one example that I picked. Um, this is focusing in this um, small mass range around mass 46. And you can see this green line is the experiment that was run with methane and CO2, but no oxygen. And you can see that our compounds um, have carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, a little bit of oxygen um, that was presumably coming from the CO2. When we added 20 parts per million oxygen into this experiment, this whole peak shifted um, to producing NO2. And so what we're seeing in these experiments is nitrogen fixation the production of organic nitrate from um, abiotic processes happening in the atmosphere. So that was really exciting. Um, nitrate tends to be one of the things that is often considered to have been a, a limiting nutrient at very parts of, uh, various parts of Earth's history um, and may have been something that was really required for life before life figured out how to fix, ni uh, fix nitrogen itself. Um, and so this particular part of early Earth's history is also an interesting time to suddenly have nitrate raining down from the atmosphere. So we thought that was pretty cool. And then it got even more interesting. So if you are a connoisseur of optical constants, please read the numbers that I'm about to show you. Um, but if you're not, I'll tell you what they mean. Um, so we did measurements of these particles um, looking at their optical constants, N and K. And what we found out was that as we put oxygen into these experiments, we took those brown particles that I showed you before a couple of times and turned them into white particles that were highly scattering. And so we changed these from particles that were really, really good at absorbing UV photons and visible photons to particles that were highly scattering and that didn't absorb any of these photons at all. You can imagine that this type of change would have a really big impact on the temperature structure of a planet. And so we thought this was also very interesting because again, this is a, a period of Earth's history where very weird things were happening with the temperature structure. We were kind of wandering in and out of Snowball Earth. Um, a lot of other things were happening. And so um, we thought this was interesting. I also like to point this out because I think people tend to think of photochemical haze particles as always being absorbing, and that's just not true. They can have the completely opposite impact on the temperature structure of a planet, depending on what they're composed of. So just a quick summary of that. With relatively small amounts of methane, we were able to produce particles in the lab um, with up to 200 parts per million molecular oxygen present in the gas phase. That means that we had substantially more oxygen than methane in these experiments. Um, as the oxygen concentration increased, the aerosol became increasingly oxygen and nitrogen rich. I didn't show you, but we did elemental analysis. And as we put more oxygen in, we ended up with these particles that really had a lot of nitrogen and oxygen in them, including that fixed nitrogen that I mentioned. And then also we know that the addition of, of molecular oxygen results in particles that are not absorbing. Just to give you a quick summary of literally everything I just said, we came out of Voyager with this idea that organic haze is produced from methane photochemistry in mildly reduced atmospheres. And this was the one true path for haze formation. And so the only places that should be hazy are atmospheres like this. I hope I've dissuaded you of that idea. Instead, what we've learned from the experiments that my group has been running and groups all over the world have been running is that there are many, many pathways for the generation of photochemical hazes. There seem to be pathways that don't require the presence of methane at all. Um, we've learned that oxygen-bearing molecules each play a really unique role in haze formation. And one of the reasons that that is important is because people have had this habit over the years of really deciding whether an atmosphere will be hazy or not simply by looking at the C to O ratio in that atmosphere, and using a metric that that's, that's that simple really neglects the fact that these molecules are very, very different. Um, we now know that oxidized atmospheres may also be favorable for, for haze formation. Um, and as the work that I just showed about early Earth shows, as a planet's atmosphere evolves, its haze will evolve too, which is all just to say that there's still a lot of work to do. <laughs> I consider that on some days to be job security and on other days to be a little bit overwhelming. Um, but that's one of the reasons why we're doing these experiments. And then just to finish up quickly, I started with Titan and these complex molecules and trying to answer this question about how complex the chemistry can be in a planetary atmosphere and therefore on its surface. And so what's the next step? Um, I already have talked about it today, but our next step is Dragonfly, um, which is a dual quadcopter that will go to Titan um, multiple landings.
landing sites over a two and a half year nominal mission, we'll sample the surface at all of our different landing sites and use the most capable mass spectrometer that has ever flown to search for things like amino acids and nucleobases and try to really understand both how complex the chemistry um, is in Titan's atmosphere, how far it's proceeded from um, subsequent processing on the surface, but also if we're super, super lucky to maybe search for life on Titan and find evidence that Titan is currently inhabited or maybe has been in its past. I'm just going to put a little movie, which is what I showed during my talk earlier, if it actually plays. Um, and so we uh, get to Titan and then decide to pull a daredevil move, which is actually just to fly off of our parachute. Um, so we get to about a kilometer above the surface on parachute and then we just get dropped. So hopefully we can fly. Because uh, if we don't, that's going to be a real bad day. Um, the good news is that day is not until 2034, so I have a really long time to stress out about it. Um, we have two drills, one on each skid. So we'll be directly sampling the surface to ingest this material into the mass spectrometer. We have some other instruments to look at the bulk surface composition. We'll be taking tons and tons of pictures. I know everybody's going to have a million questions about Dragonfly, but I've already talked for way too long. Um, so as Dragonfly flies off into the distance, um, <laughs> I'm going to thank you for attention. Um, and with that, I hope I can take a few questions. Thank you. That was great. Um, okay, uh, questions for uh, Sarah. Uh, let's start back here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for the like mild panic about realizing that you were there while I was going to show your plot. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I have a question for you about the time skills for your experiment. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so um, our standard experiments we run for 72 hours, so they're a continuous flow experiment, so the gases are flowing into and out of the chamber. Um, our gases on average are exposed to the energy source for about 10 seconds. Um, that's still a higher energy deposition rate um, than you would see in most planetary atmospheres that have haze formation. Um, the main reason for that is honestly because I asked my grad students if they wanted to sit in the lab for a thousand years and watch an experiment, and oddly enough, they all said no. Um, and so we have to do some things to kind of speed up the chemistry. Um, but it's one of the reasons we do these experiments as a flow experiment to try to minimize um, the potential over-processing of the material that would happen. Um, so until about 1995, the, the experiments prior to that were all closed. And so they would fill them with, with the gases and then just like dump energy into them for like many, many hours or days. And that material tends um, to be very different than the stuff that we see now. Um, but uh, this leads me to something that I always end up saying during talks, which is that, you know, um, these experiments are just one tool that we have in our toolkit, and the nice thing about them is that we can poke them. Planets don't like it when you poke them. Um, we're doing that experiment on Earth right now, and it doesn't seem to appreciate it very much. Um, but we can, we can change things in the lab, but we will never be able to, to do a, a really good job of reproducing the chemistry. And so that's why we rely on observations and models and all of these other things. Um, but yeah, we wish we could run at lower energy deposition rates, but alas, it would be really painful for everyone involved. <laughs> uh, Robin? Yeah, I guess so just to follow up directly on that, I mean, one way of bridging that gap, right, is to, to like, model the experiments, like the strain reaction yep. rates, and then hope you have some chance with the chemical models that we currently run in vast abundance for exoplanets and take the right answer. Yeah, so one thing I would love to do, and we haven't, so I started out in photochemical modeling, and I somehow have never found the time or energy to actually take our Titan photochemistry model and apply it to our chamber. But that's one thing I would really love to do is actually partner with a modeler um, to modify their model to, to actually you know, be applicable to the conditions in our chamber and see if, like, without screwing around very much, we're even remotely getting the same answer. Um, I'm suspicious that the answer will be no. There have been a couple of groups who've done that. There's a, a group at NASA Ames led by Ellis Yama O'Brien that have used a photochemistry model to look at their lab experiment. Um, there's a group in France that's done it once before. Um, but I think that would be something that would be a really good test because, as you well know, a lot of the reaction rates and cross-sections and everything else that go into these photochemistry models are not well known for the phase space that, um, that exoplanets span. And so that's a really big problem for a lot of the modeling efforts, and it would be interesting to see how much that's affecting the results. Okay, uh, let's see. Next. 
Uh, focus to NO2. Right. Also, uh, does it depend on the amount of the oxygen that you add? Could it be that you end up, if you increase it further and further, the other molecules get extracted as well? Or is there any intuitive way to understand why only NO2 was forming? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so like I said, it's a little hard to know at some point how much of that is to do with the chemistry and how much of that is to do with the fact that we're just losing our photons that generate the chemistry. But if you look at the behavior of that particular peak as a function of the oxygen abundance, basically at first it increases, like I showed you. Um, as we go to higher oxygen abundances, it starts decreasing again, but the other peaks don't come back. It's just because our overall production rates of everything are decreasing as we get to that highest oxygen concentration that I was using. I don't know if that fully answers your question, but yeah. Okay, Martin. So I'm sure you know that there are amino acids in meteorites. Yes. And so presumably they can, they can form in a, a protoplanetary nebula. Right. I wonder if your particle irradiation was a likely path for that. I keep forgetting that we're being streamed because I was going to tell you something and now I'm debating if I should tell you or not. <laughs> okay, internet, don't tell anyone. Um, our. Uh, Oh, Lord, I can't believe I'm saying this publicly. Okay, so the, no, no, it's actually, it's really cool. Um, so just don't tell anyone, Internet. Um, the the water-dominated experiments that we did at 300 Kelvin, when you look at them in the mass spectrometer, they look exactly like meteorite organics, which is really cool. And someday we'll actually write a paper about that. Um, but that actually is really interesting to me because I think, um, there's the possibility now that we're doing all of these simulation experiments, I mean, not just us, but people do this for meteorites, they do it for, for planetary nebula, for all of these things, to actually start thinking about the possibility of constraining what, like really constraining what the initial conditions were, because you get such different organic signatures depending on what your conditions are. And we've known this all along, but we didn't really have the tools in terms of the mass spectrometry to really be able to dig down into the meteorite organics. But now that we have all these really ultra high resolution techniques, and we can really, really do a good job of identifying the tens of thousands of molecules you see in meteorite organics, I think we have the possibility to actually use that to figure out a lot more information about what the volatiles were like, um, which is one of the things that we don't have really good constraints on. Yeah, I can't believe I just told the internet that. Don't tell anyone. All right, so hold on. So um, Mercedes <laughs> and then Erwin. So Mercedes, go ahead. Yeah. So, so my question was about that plot where you showed that <coughs> plasma, you get a lot more stuff than the Yeah. Um, what kind of ions are you using in the plasma? I mean, is that representative of areas of Yeah, so, no ish. <laughs> so, the, so, the first thing is it's a cold plasma source. And so, the important thing about that is um, that means that it doesn't change the temperature of our gases. So, it's just the energetic electrons that we get. Um, we haven't done the measurements for our chamber. But people who run very similar plasmas have done more work to, to characterize their plasma. And what they see is that the energy distribution of the electrons is actually relatively similar to the energy distribution that you get from the sun. Um, now, of course, you run into the issue that an electron running into a molecule is not the same as a photon running into a molecule uh, in terms of cross-sections and all of those things. Um, but at least big picture, the energy distribution of these plasmas seems to be relatively analogous to the energy distribution of a star. Now, we start running into all of these issues with stellar type. And I say this every time I give a talk, but if someone could please build me a, like, dial a star in my lab so that I can be like, oh, it's an MDOR. Oh, it's like, just switch back and forth um, and have the perfect spectrum. I would really appreciate that. Um, so far, no one has taken me up on the offer. Um, but if you know a way to do that, um, I would be your best friend forever. So please let me know. <laughs> All right, Erwin. I'd like to make a comment first and then ask a question. Okay. My comment, as I sat here listening to these fantastic results, I couldn't help thinking that Stanley Miller died a dozen years too soon. Oh. <laughs> With your You're going to make me cry. Thank you so much. That's a very, very kind thing to say. My question is trivial in comparison. <laughs> I was wondering if you knew basically from chemistry basics why nitrogen prefers to be in the solid state. Yeah, so... There's a couple of things that could be going on with that, and they're also actually related to what we're seeing going on with oxygen. So the first thing, which sounds kind of silly, um, is that nitrogen is heavier than carbon. 
and oxygen is also heavier than carbon. And on average, all other things being equal, the heavier a molecule is, the more likely it is to want to be a solid. Um, so that's a really simple explanation. Um, the other potential explanation is to do with the functional groups that we're seeing the nitrogen in, in these experiments. Um, they tend to mostly be in nitriles, which also tend to favor the solid phase over the gas phase, at least in these conditions. Um, but we haven't spent a ton of time um, really thinking much further than that, um, because we were just so interested in the fact that it happened that at that point we didn't really care why it was happening, which is maybe not a scientific answer. Um, but I think it is really um, interesting. There has been some really beautiful work that was done. Um, the advanced light source at um, Berkeley has been used to actually do some of these experiments. And um, the disadvantage to using a synchrotron for these types of experiments is you end up with these really narrow wavelengths. But the cool thing is that you can really study exactly which photons are doing what. And one of the other things that they found out is that it isn't just um, that the nitrogen is partitioning into the solid that makes this um, effect of the production rate increasing happen, but also the ionization of the nitrogen results in this uh, really interesting catalytic effect in the gas phase, and so basically having those nitrogen ions running around makes the hydrocarbon chemistry more efficient. Um, so there's two different things that are happening with the nitrogen in the gas phase that turn out to both be really important, and that was something that was super surprising to everybody, but it's really exciting not just for us, but also you know, going back to thinking about um, the chemistry that's happening in disks, you know, all of these places where you have molecular nitrogen, it really, people tend to think of it as boring, right? Triple bond, it's effectively inert. It's like, Effectively inert is not the same thing as being actually inert, um, and it turns out it's not actually inert in the presence of these EUV photons. Okay. Um, there were more questions. I think we're going to stop there, and if anybody has questions, you just please come up. But let's, uh, uh, let's please thank Professor uh, Hurst again. <laughs>